Good morning and welcome to the Midwest Technical Inspections Virtual Seminars. My name is Doug Bennett. I'm one of the Quality Assurance and Training Managers here at MTI. This morning, our session is on the BVSC, which is our commercial valuation system. And the BVSC stands for Beck Valuation System Commercial. Uh, that's because we use the Marshall Swift Beck Valuation Company. So <clears throat> when we are filling out these forms for the valuation, what we're doing is we're actually just putting in uh, all the, the raw data points for the valuation. And then when you submit this work to our office, our reviewer will look over it. And then if they agree with your entry, they will hit submit. And that will actually send it off to the MSB website. And it goes through an automated process where it'll actually take all of that raw data that you have, it'll run it through their calculator, and then it will spit back a value at us. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're running these valuations is, is that you don't actually see the value. It, we don't get a, an actual value back until it runs through the automated process here in our office. So you are just putting in the raw data. But because it is an automated process, there's a lot of uh, like particular uh, peculiarities of how we enter the information so that it will run through that process uh, properly. So there's a lot of things that could cause it to actually kind of snag or, or cause an error if you enter the information in the incorrect fashion. That's why the BVSC is our, our single most commonly mismarked or misused form that we have. So uh, that is why we're offering up these classes for you to help you to identify where uh, you might be making some of those, those errors or some of those mistakes that might cause it to err. So we have two training documents that you should already have, but if not, I will send you a copy after this class just to make sure that you have a copy of these two documents. But those two documents are um, the BVSC guidelines, which is this one right here, where all I did is we just took a, a screenshot of the form and then we went in and put these little uh, chat icons here. So it, you'll see these little yellow chat bubbles. If you hover your mouse over that chat bubble, it'll give you uh, an explanation of what we're looking for on that particular line uh, of the form so that you know from line by line what you should be entering in there. And you can just kind of scroll through and see every single one of these lines what you should be putting in for that particular line. The second document that we have is the common errors document. So we went through and identified the 17 most common errors that we make or that inspectors are making on the BVSC form and then we put them in here. So now you can go through and you can see, okay, here's what the error is, kind of a, a brief explanation of what the error is. And then we have examples of what you should not do versus what you should do. So we have that for all 17 of the most commonly made errors. So you can see again, here's the error, here's what you should, do, should not do, and here's what you should do. And it is bookmarked over here. So if you wanted to find a specific one, if you're looking to say for information on the metal sandwich panels, you can go straight to that one by clicking on the bookmark. Uh, but this is this document is a, a great help because this is the these are the most commonly made errors. Uh, this is something that you'll oftentimes receive feedback from the reviewer, and we may kind of identify one of these 17 errors for you. Um, these are some things that we track to look for trends uh, and we can give you feedback based on these common errors. I am going to go through all of this information, uh, not necessarily from these forms here, uh, but you will have these later today uh, for, in your email. And I'm just gonna go through a blank form here to kind of show you and illustrate all of those different components. So when you're filling out the BVSC, one of the first things to, to realize is that uh, since this is just this is going to be an automated process, we can't have any kind of like extra characters or extra symbols or anything like that. So we shouldn't have text. We shouldn't have things like a percent sign. We shouldn't have like the little tick mark for feet or the word years or anything like that. It, it should just be the raw data. Another thing to consider is that we should never have more than one building on a single BVSC. So if you have multiple buildings, then you would, you would potentially need to have multiple BVSCs. I say potentially because we are going to do one BVSC for every style of structure that you come across. 
So, for example, if you go to an apartment complex that has five buildings, but all five buildings are identical, you know, they're the same square footage, they're the same construction materials, same age, same occupancy, uh, you know, everything's the same about them. Well, then there's there's no reason to complete the exact same thing five times and get the exact same value back five times, uh, because we do get charged for every one of the BVSCs that we run. We're just going to run one BVSC representing one of those five buildings and then just identify that there are five of those identical style of buildings. But if we go to the apartment complex with five buildings and there's five different styles of buildings, you know, they have different square footages or maybe different number of stories or different construction materials or different occupancy, there's something that's unique about them. Well, then we would have to actually complete a separate BVSC for every one of those styles. So my report came with just the one BVSC attached to it. So if I had some a situation like that, then I'd have to come to my details page here, scroll down to the BVSC and hit add to add additional BVSCs until I had one for every style of structure that I had at that location. So uh, you really wanna make sure that you're providing those extra BVSCs. That's the single most common time that we add a form to the to web inspectors for that BVSC. The, another thing to consider is that most of our reports come with a BVSC automatically populated, but it does not necessarily mean that you have to fill out the BVSC. So our standard operating procedure is to uh, identify whether or not the insured owns the building. If the insured owns the building, then we will complete the BVSC. If the insured is just a tenant in the location, well, they're not going to be responsible for replacing the building, so it doesn't really matter how much that replacement cost is. So we, we would just not complete the BVSC on that. So you don't have the ability to delete the BVSC. So if it's one of those instances where the insured is just a tenant at the location, uh, you would just leave the BVSC blank. You, you, don't, you don't need to fill it out. Uh, don't, you don't need to waste your time. Uh, another instance of this would be for auto owners insurance. They're our single biggest client, so most of our inspectors do work for auto owners. Um, they have a deck page that they attach to the report. So you would go to your attachments and you would look at the deck page that's attached. And on that, they're going to have a list of all of the structures they have for that particular policy. And they will have certain buildings highlighted in green. And so the green buildings are the ones that you're supposed to inspect. Well, the first line for each one of those buildings that they have highlighted is the building limit. If they have a value listed next to their building limit, then they are expecting a valuation to be completed. If it is blank next to the building limit, well, then they are not expecting a BBC, even though it is populated here in your web inspect. So you can actually just leave that blank if there's no value listed next to the, the building limit. So those are instances where you would not complete the BVSC, even though it is shown as ordered here on the report. So that being said, those are some of the kind of generic uh, entry guidelines that we have. Now we'll, we'll get into the actual form here. So this first section of the, the report is mostly going to be left blank. This is really, uh, a lot of this information is being gathered automatically through our uh, details page. So as part of that automated process, it grabs that information from the various uh, uh, points of that details page. So there's no reason for you to, to copy that over and put that information in here. The one item that we will sometimes uh, complete is the location name. And we'll use this to identify uh, which building we're working on if we have multiple buildings on this particular ticket. So, you know, if we had, you know, apartment building with five buildings, well, then this would be where we could identify, okay, this one is for building A, or this one's for building B or C or et cetera. Uh, so that's where you could get, then put in the label there so that we know which particular building this specific valuation goes with. So it's really only needed if there's multiple buildings. The exception to that would be, again, for auto owners. So for auto owners, they provide us with their own building ID number. And so at the top of each one of those green highlighted buildings, it'll say uh, a location number and a building number. So it'd be like 00001-0001 for location one, building one. They want us to use that, that specific building ID number for all of their reports. So regardless of how many buildings are, they want you to put that building ID number here on this top line so that they can mark that up. 
So you would just enter in the, the 0001-0001 right there to identify that particular one for auto owners. But for all of our other work, if there's only one building listed out the property, then you would not need to put anything there because we know exactly which value, which building that valuation goes to. And then these other three lines, you would just leave blank and we'll go with our, our system defaults on those. The second section, the miscellaneous cost adjustments, this is another section that you're going to leave all of these blank. And we're going to go with uh, the, the, whatever the system develops for that. Uh, those information. The next one we have is section name, and this one uh, will only need to be filled out if you have multiple sections. Well, that begs the question of when do I need to have multiple sections? So there's two legitimate reasons to have more than one section on a BDSC. And those two instances are if there's multiple elevations, so if you have like part of the structure is one story only and part of the structure is two stories, well then you would need to split that into two separate uh, sections there. So I have, a, have an example of that right here on Google Maps. Uh, so if I go into the street view to look at this structure, zoom in here a little bit. So if I look over here on the left-hand side, you see this is like the warehouse area. This is one story only. But if I look over here on the, the right-hand side, the office area, this is two stories. So I would have to split this building into two separate sections for the BBSC. So section one of my, my BBSC would just be this portion over here that's one story. And section two of my BBSC would just be this section over here that's two stories. So that's the, the most common time that we would actually split a building into multiple sections is if you have multiple elevations like this. If the whole thing had been one story or if the whole thing had been two story, well then I would only need one section. But since there's different elevations, I have to split it into different sections. The second reason to split a building into multiple sections is if you have a change in the year of construction. So like if they've, uh, the building was built in 1950, but then in 1980, they put an addition onto it then you would have to split that into multiple sections. So section one would be the original structure and section two would be just the addition. So that's the only two times that you would split a building into multiple sections. So we have a lot of, a lot of inspectors that try to split it up for other reasons. Maybe they'll split it up because of the construction type or maybe they'll split it up because of the occupancy, but there's only two legitimate reasons to split a building into multiple sections. So if you have one of those two instances where you need to split it into multiple sections, right here at section name is where you would then go ahead and uh, enter in a name so we know what section of the building you're, you're working on. So maybe you know one story or two story or original or 1980 edition, you know, something like that, some way of identifying what part of the building you're actually working on. But if again, if, if it's just one, if you're only filling out one section, you just leave it blank. This next section, you'll see it tells you right here to leave this blank for system defaults. So you're just going to leave these as the NAs that they came as. Don't waste your time trying to figure out and fill in these different uh, components here because if you fill them in, once it comes into our office, our reviewer is just going to move them back to NA. So you've now just wasted your time and wasted the reviewer's time by filling that, that out. So just leave it as the NA for the system default and leave this last one blank. So then we get to the depreciation, which is the first section that we're really going to have to, to fill out for our, our form. And the building uh, dep depreciation just means that as this building ages, it loses value. So just like when you drive your car off the sales lot, it starts to lose its value as soon as you drive off the lot. Well, as the building ages, it loses value as well. So we're just trying to figure out approximately how much value it has lost. And so there's some calculators that the MSB company has come up with to help determine how much value is being lost on this building. So the first thing you have to do is identify the building condition. So there's five options here, and these are uh, subjective. So you know you and I can look at the same building and give two different answers and both be right. Uh, it is a, a subjective answer, but we do have a couple of guidelines for you on uh, when you're trying to rate the, the building condition. So the first option that you have there is excellent. And excellent is designed 
for brand new buildings. So if it is one year old or newer, then it could be excellent. As soon as it's more than a year old, it can no longer be excellent. Uh, it, it would then just be good. So good means that this thing is aging well, that they're taking good care of it. There's no noted deficiencies, you know, the maintenance is being uh, uh, done. So the, this thing is actually better than what you might expect for a building of its age. Average 10 is going to be the vast majority of the building we look at, where it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with it, it just means that it looks like it's, it's age. You know, it, it's got some minor uh, wear and tear just because it's a building that has been aging. It uh, doesn't mean that they're deficient in anything, it's just it's average. Poor then would be when we start to see some lack of maintenance, where there may be some cosmetic or aesthetic issues with it, uh, maybe some peeling paints or some cracking or some things like that that make it look a little bit older than what it actually is. And then very poor is when we start to get into some actual structural concerns, where there's maybe some structural supports that are, are uh, failing or there's just some actual concerns about potential for collapse or failure of this structure. So those are the five options that you have. So the vast majority of the time, you're probably just going to be picking average, uh, uh, but it is subjective. So you just kind of take a look at it and make your best guesstimate. The effective age, uh, this is where we're going to determine approximately how, how much it has aged. And that is a very loaded complex uh, calculation. So to simplify things, to get some uniformity across all of our reports, and just to make things consistent, we have come down with a standard of just the effective age is one half of the actual age. So let's say that my building was built in 1980, that makes it 42 years old. So my effective age would just be 21, because that's half of the actual age. And again, you want to make sure that you're putting just the raw numbers in there. Don't put like years or anything like that after it, just the raw number there. The next section for the superstructure, so the number of stories, that's pretty easy. So what, how many stories tall is this particular section? So on my uh, Google Maps example there, if I'm doing the warehouse section, I would put a one because that's how, it's only one story tall. If I'm doing the office section, well then I would put two because that part of the building is two stories tall gross floor area that's going to be the total square footage for that particular section so you know how how many square feet is the warehouse portion or how many square feet is the the office area so when i'm measuring on the satellite i'm only getting the ground floor square footage so for that office area i'm going to have to take that ground floor square footage and multiply it by two because there's two floors there so it's the total square footage for the gross perimeter i'm going to leave that one completely blank uh, we found over the years that if we add a, a gross perimeter in there, it actually overcalculates. So we just leave it blank and let the system default to what it's, whatever it's going to default to there. So go ahead and leave that blank. If you waste your time calculating the perimeter, it comes in here. Our reviewer is just going to delete it. So you, you don't want to waste your time on that. Construction quality is a little bit more complex. Now we're looking at uh the design of the structure as well as the materials that are being used and we're comparing this to other like occupancies so you're looking at this office and comparing it to other offices or looking at that garage and comparing it to other garages and trying to give us an idea of the complexity of the design and the quality of the materials that they're using so you know, marshall swiftback says that 80% of all of the buildings in the United States fall into the average category. Well, just based on the type of work that we do, we don't typically do the very bare bones minimum structures. We don't typically do the very high end structures. So our percentage is gonna be even greater than that. We're gonna probably more like 90, 95% of the buildings that we look at are gonna be considered average. Now, you have the ability to adjust beyond average if you need to. So if you uh, you'll go to this, this office building and it is extremely basic it's just a rectangle with minimal uh, materials like just bare concrete block walls and just a very basic shed roof you know then maybe you want to bump that down to economy because compared to other offices that's pretty basic and pretty uh, it's unimpressive i guess you would say so you could bump that down to economy then to adjust for the the lack of 
design is lack of materials. Or if you go the other way, maybe you go to a, a office that is extremely fancy. Maybe it's got angled wings off of the angled wings, or it's got a lot of expensive materials. Maybe it's got some marbles or some uh, a lot of just decorative devices like copings, cornices, molding, things like that to really just amp it up a little bit. Maybe you want to go then to the average plus. Uh, it would be very rare for you to go anything above average plus. Uh, you know, I've been here for 20 years. I've used Superior one time on uh, Masonic Temple that I did, but uh, otherwise, it's I think average plus is is going to be enough for anything that we're we're looking at as far as uh, valuing them. We just don't get into the types of structures that are going to be up in the Superior plus premium all that stuff. So you know. The vast, vast majority of what you look at is going to fall into average, but you could possibly do economy or, or average plus, depending on the construction quality. Year built, that's going to be the original year of that that section was constructed. I don't care if it was gut rehab or anything like that. This is the original year it was constructed, and it should just be listed as the year. So this next section, the occupancy code, this is probably the, the more complicated part of this form. So we have to decide what was this building designed for? What was its purpose? And they give us this long list of different occupancies that we can choose from. You know, they have the, the number and then the label for that occupancy. And we have to decide which one of these occupancies best describes what the original intent of this structure was. Not necessarily what they're currently using it as, but what was it originally designed for? So to help you out with these occupancy codes, we actually have in the library, if you open up the library and what is back here, towards the bottom, we have a section called resource materials. And you will see in here, here's the BVSC guidelines. This is the, one of those documents that we were talking about as a help document where it has a little chat bubble on it. That's this one right here, the BVSC guidelines. But we also have in here the occupancy code guides. So if I wanted to, you know, I know it's a habitational occupancy, but I'm not sure which specific habitational occupancy, I can then pull up this guide and I have all the codes over here that I can jump to, but it'll give me the, the number, the label, and then it'll give me a definition of what that means. What is a, an apartment low rise? And then over on the right hand side, it'll give me a sample photo. So this is just one example of what that might look like. Obviously, this can't represent every single instance of an apartment low rise, but this is one example of what that might look like. So you can come in here and you can kind of educate yourself on which, what's the difference between these different occupancy codes so that you can accurately decide which one is the best for your particular risk. So for example, let's say, you know, we're trying to figure out if this is an older apartment low rise or an apartment low rise older. Well, I can see right here that Apartment low rise older has to be built before 1950. So, you know, for all of the occupancy codes that say older behind them, this is going to apply. It needs to be built before 1950. So, if it was built after 1950, then I'm just going to go with the apartment low rise. So, you have all of those different occupancy codes in here. So, you can come in here and kind of uh, educate yourself on what, what's the differences between them and figure out which one best applies to your particular risk. Now, you could actually have multiple occupancies for a, a structure. Uh, you could actually have multiple occupancies within one section of a structure. So we have the ability here to put up to five different occupancy codes. So, you know, we could put that part of the building is, uh, you know, a store or shop general. And part of the building is the apartment low rise. And then I could then where it says percentage, I could break it down and say, okay, it's 25% store shop general and 75% apartment low rise. Well, this is actually such a common combination where like the, the ground floor level is the store and then, you know, the two to three stories above it is apartments that they've actually made this into its own occupancy code. So when I get down here to the store and shops, there's actually one here for store with apartment above. So I can actually then just change that to 100%, and it saves me from having to enter in multiple occupancy codes then, because that's a, a common combination that they've already accounted for. 
So you do want to make sure you're really looking through those different occupancy codes. You'll, you'll find that there's just a, a small amount of them that you use regularly, but you do want to make sure you're familiar with all of the occupancy codes so that you can find the one that best applies to you. So the next item we have here is the story height. So for every one of these occupancy codes, you need to put in the average story height. So this is going to be the average per floor. So if we go to our uh, common errors document here, and we go to the section for story height, this gives you some examples of how you might calculate that. So here we have a one story building that's all, the, the whole thing is 12 foot high. So from the floor to the next floor or to the roof, uh, it, it's 12 feet tall. Well, that tells us really that the average story height is 12 feet. But if we have multiple stories, well, let's say that it's three stories, but all three stories are 10 feet tall. Well, that makes it easy again. The average story height per floor is 10 feet. But if it's, there's multiple stories and there are multiple, or there's different heights per floor, that's where we have to then get into some calculations to figure out what's the average height. So there was two floors that were 10 feet and one floor that was 19 feet. So 10 plus 10 plus 19 divided by three gives us the average of 13 feet for the story height. This one's even more complicated where it's all one story, but there's different floor or story heights within that one story. And so the section A is smaller than section B. So we had to add more weight to section B than we had to section A. So you know you can kind of see the different calculations that they did down here to figure out that this, the average story height here is actually 17 feet. So you know these are just some examples of how you might figure that out. Now, it is going to be a little bit of a guesstimate here where we're not expecting you to you know, really get into uh, a lot of math on that, but just give us a, a basic idea or a basic guesstimate. Most of our structures, you know, the average is going to be about eight or nine feet for most occupancies. Now, it, depending on what it is, it may get higher than that, et cetera, but it's not likely to be less than eight feet. So you would just put the, the number of feet there. Uh, a lot of our inspectors will get confused and they'll, they'll confuse this with the number of stories and they'll just put like a one there. That would mean that this building was only one foot tall. So you, you wanna make sure that you're putting in the story height here as feet. But again, you have the ability to do up to five different occupancy codes here. You just want to make sure that you add up to 100%. So once you get your 100%, you can leave the rest of them blank. Construction type. Uh, this is the ISO class construction. So this is a rating scale uh, that tells you the combustibility of the structure. So class one frame is going to be the most combustible structure. A class six fire resistant is going to be the least combustible structure. So we have to tell what percentage of the section is each one of these classes of construction. Most of the time, when you have a building, you know, it's just one class construction. So you would just put a 100 next to one of these classes here. But it is possible that they have different uh, construction types, especially if they have different occupancies. It's possible they have different construction types for you know, within that one section. And so you would just have to then calculate and break down what percentage of the section is each one of those so that it totals up to 100%. With a building substructure, the, the BBSC automatically assumes that the building has a slab foundation. So if you do have a slab foundation, then you don't need to do anything at all in this section. You just leave it blank and let it do the system default for the slab foundation. If your foundation is anything other than a slab foundation, well, then you need to come in here and you need to fill out this section to identify what is the foundation for that particular building. So the first item we have is potential is a basement. Uh, so if we have a basement, we actually have a couple of different answers we have to fill out for that basement. First and foremost, we have to identify whether it is an unfinished basement, a finished basement, or a mixture of part of it's finished, part of it's unfinished. And so we would then come in here and we put in the square footage for the unfinished basement or the square footage for the finished basement. This is an important thing to identify or to notice here is that this is asking for square footages. Most of our report is asking for percentages, but this section is asking for a square footage. So you do want to list it as square footage, not as percentage. 
Uh, but let's say we had a 3,000 square foot basement and 2,000 square feet of it was finished. So we could go, you know, 1,000 square foot unfinished and 2,000 square foot finished, and that'll count for all of the basement square footage. If we had, you know, if it was all unfinished, we could just leave the finished section blank. Uh, so you know, it's just a, a matter of looking at what you actually have. We don't want to put zeros in here. The BVSC doesn't know what to do with a zero. So just if it doesn't apply, just leave it blank. Basement occupancy, we need to then determine what is the occupancy of that basement. The basement is typically going to be the same occupancy as the, the rest of the structure, but uh, there are times where it's, it's different. Uh, but when we go to the occupancy for the basement, we have all of the different occupancy codes that we saw up above for the rest of the structure, but we're primarily going to be using just these first couple here that say basement for them. So if it's uh, the whole thing is unfinished, then I would put basement unfinished. If the whole thing's finished, I would put basement finished. If it's a mixture, then I would put basement partially finished. The other option we have here is for basement underground parking. So if, it, if it's devoted for parking on the basement, then I would go ahead and choose that option. So if I have a finished basement, I choose basement finished, it's going to then calculate it, assuming that it's the same occupancy as the rest of the structure. If it's different occupancy, that is why we have all of these other options here. So if we get to our, our building and the basement level is a store, but everything ground floor and above is apartments, well then that's where I'd wanna come in here and I'd wanna choose you know, the store or shop general for my basement occupancy because uh, I want to make sure that it calculates differently than the rest of the structure. So that's why we have all the, the occupancies, but the vast majority of the time, you're going to just use one of these first couple that say basement with them. Once we have the square footages, we have the occupancy, now we have to tell the construction type of the basement. The basement may very well be a different construction than the rest of the building. Actually, quite often it is. You know, most frame buildings will have a uh, masonry basement. So, like, there will be poured concrete walls or something like that in the basement. So, it would be at least a joist and masonry building or basement, even though the rest of the building, everything above grade, would be made of frame or, or wood. So, we do need to identify the basement construction type. And then finally, we need to identify the basement depth. So, how deep is that basement in feet? So if we had a basement, we would potentially need to fill out all uh, five of these potential answers here. If it is not a basement, if it's uh, a different type of foundation, then we can come down here and we just put in the square footage for whatever base or foundation type we have. So if there's a crawl space, what's the square footage of the crawl space? If there's stilt wood, what's the square footage of the stilt wood? If there's stilt concrete, what's the square footage of that? This last item here, this is one that confuses a lot of people because they see the word slab here and they think, oh, well, mine's a slab foundation, so I'm going to put something here. But this is actually to, to remove the slab cost. So again, the system automatically assumes that you have a slab. And if you come in here and tell it that you need to remove that slab cost, it's going to then calculate it like it's just a dirt floor. So you would, you know, if you had that dirt floor where there's no foundation, then you could come in here and you could put the square footage that is that dirt floor and it would remove that auto, that assumed value there. If you have a foundation or a slab foundation, you just leave this section blank. All right, the next section we have the exterior walls. So this very first question, you see that it says to leave this one blank. So you're not gonna you're not gonna fill in the wall openings here. You're just going to skip straight to the wall finishes, and you have the ability to add up the three different wall finishes here. So you can do the drop down to find all your different wall finish choices, find the one that applies to your particular risk, and then you put the percentage of the exterior that is that particular uh, material. And so you want to add up to 100% here. If you have more than uh, five, or excuse me, more than uh, three exterior wall materials, then you're just going to pick the three most prevalent and use those three. So you just want it to add up to 100% though. Some commonly mismarked ones. Uh, the single most commonly mismarked one is this insulated sandwich panel. 
Uh, this is actually one of the items on our common airs. So metal sandwich panel is actually going to be a sheet of metal with a couple of inches of insulation and then another sheet of metal that are sandwiched together to form a panel. They then connect that panel to another panel to another panel to form the walls. So it is a, a very, it, it's a, an expensive process. It's something that's used strictly for uh, extremely cold operations. So if they need to like keep a walk-in freezer basically, where the whole room has to stay uh, really cold, they could then use these sandwich panels for that extra insulation to keep that, that room extra cold. Most of the time what we see is actually just this corrugated steel siding like this and then Spectra will mark that as the sandwich panel and that is not at all what this is. This is just your standard uh, steel siding. So uh, on the BVSC we would actually mark that then as the siding metal other and depending on what is holding it up whether it be on girders or on masonry or on wood studs uh, but it's going to be one of those siding metal other options there not the insulated sandwich panel. But again, you just find the, the material that applies to your risk and then put the percentage so we want it to add up to 100%. You have the ability to do up to three different walls, wall finishes. Similar concept with the roof, only now we only have two options here. So you can do up to two different roof materials. Uh, so you know, most common would be like an asphalt shingle or maybe a steel roof um, or maybe a single ply membrane for a flat roof. But those are the, the most common ones. Uh, we do see a, a lot of inspectors will try to mark the metal sandwich panels. Again, that is not what we're talking about here. Uh, you know, most of the time when we see those metal roofs, they're just the standing steam, steam metal. This would just be called steel. It is not the insulated sandwich panel. Um, it would just it would just fall under steel here. So you pick your material, and then put the percentage of the roof that is that particular material. You have the ability to choose up to two different materials for the roof. Next, we have to give the roof pitch. So we have flat, low, medium, or high. To help you determine uh, what the pitch is, we do have on the BBSC guidelines here. When we scroll down to that part of the form, there's some definitions of what they're looking for there. So a flat roof, means that it's pretty much a, a not a visible pitch There's, there might be some pitch to it just for water drainage but uh, it's not really a visible pitch so what they're looking for is something that is going to be less than a 212 pitch to the roof so that means for every 12 inches you go left to right or horizontally this roof is going to raise less than two inches up and down so it's a very small pitch to it low pitch then is going to be for between a 212 and a 612 pitch. So for every 12 inches left to right, this is gonna go up and down two to six inches. So, you know, that's something that's not, not a very steep incline on that, that roof. Then the, most of the roofs we look at are gonna probably fall into that medium category where they're between an 812 and a 1212 pitch roof. So every 12 inches left to right, they're rising eight to 12 inches. And then high would be more like your like church buildings or something like that, where this is an extremely high pitch where it's greater than the, like the 15, 12 uh, pitch. So this is something that you're not gonna wanna try and walk on. Um, this, this is a really steep roof. So you're gonna estimate what percentage of the roof falls into each one of these. These are subjective because we're not getting up there. We're not measuring the rise and run of these roofs. Uh, so this is what you can see from the ground. How, what pitch do you think this falls into? And it is percentages, so we just want it to total up to 100%. Here. Floor interior floor finishes. So here we're going to again have a drop down where we can choose up to four different floor finishes. Um, you you want to make sure you're you're identifying all of the different floor finishes that you have in that risk. So as you're walking through the the property, you're probably going to want to jot yourself a few notes anytime you see a change in the flooring. You know, just jot yourself a note that hey, this is now this room here is carpeting, this room is tile, etc., so that you can make sure you're getting all of those different uh, materials on there. So you know, we'll see a lot of people they'll mark 100% for carpeting, but then that doesn't really match up because 
most buildings don't have carpeting in the bathroom or like in the kitchen or in the entry foyer you know those those places usually have some sort of like tile or something or maybe a hardwood or something like that to, that's uh, easier to wipe up spills and things like that so make sure you're identifying all of the different materials and then giving a percentage for all of those uh, Most of these are pretty self, the common ones that we use, the carpeting, concrete seal or topping. Anytime you can see the raw concrete, we'll mark it as the concrete seal or topping. Uh, we do have against a lot of the hardwoods or the tile ceramics or the tile vinyl composite. Those are the most common ones that we would see in most of the buildings that we look at. If you need definitions of the others, you can go into the BVSC guidelines here. And right there, when you hover over the interior floor finish, it does show you the definitions of some of those other flooring materials. Next section we have is the interior wall partitions. And you'll see that this one says to leave this section blank for the system defaults. So again, do not waste your time calculating this, these values here because once it comes into our office, the reviewer will just delete that information, so you don't want to waste your time. Interior wall finish and interior ceiling finish. These two are a little bit unique in the fact that you can actually have more than 100% for these values. And actually quite often you will have more than 100% for these values. So the single most common wall finish that we see is going to be a painted drywall. So to correctly calculate the painted drywall, we would actually have to mark both the, the drywall and the paint. Because if I were to put just 100% for drywall, it would calculate it as if it was just a raw, unfinished drywall. You know, it, the seams may have been mudded, but there's no finish on that drywall. If I were to mark just it as 100% paint, well then it would, it would be like the paint was directly on the structural support. So directly on the concrete block or directly on the, the wood studs or whatever it is. So to correctly calculate painted drywall, we would actually have to do 100% drywall and 100% paint. So that's, that's a, a commonly uh, used one where it actually is more than 100% for the, the wall finish. Similar idea with the ceiling finish, uh, you know, again, for paint, painted drywall, you could even have like a textured drywall where, uh, so you have the texture finish here, so you can add more than 100% for the, the ceiling finish. Uh, some of them painted drywall and then the suspended acoustical are the two most common ceiling finishes that we have uh, throughout all of our properties. Heating system and cooling system. So we have, for both of these, we have the ability to choose up to two different systems, and then we put the percentage for each of those systems. So we have on here, uh, there's the first item here is the boiler and piping only. For this item, this is assuming that the boiler is located outside of the, the structure. So like in a boiler house that's located away from it, and then it pipes that steam into the structure from that remote location. That's most of the time when we see a boiler heating system, it's actually the boiler is located inside the building and then the steam is just run through like a radiator uh, to heat up this, the, the rest of the building. So steam and hot water with radiators is what you would use if the, if the boiler is actually inside the location. Um, forced warm air is our most common type of, of heating and cooling. Uh, for like garage occupancies, a lot of times, or warehouses, a lot of times you'll see those suspended unit heaters. Um, in our southern regions, you might see the heat pump, which is just a way of using the uh, AC compression, so the, the compression of the, the Freon. Well, you can also use the decompression of that Freon to heat. So it's just using both the, the compression and the decompression of that Freon for the heating and cooling within the same unit. So rather than having a separate for, uh, furnace for the heating, they're just using that same compressor unit to do both the heating and cooling. But you choose the, the heating system that applies and then you put the percentage here. You have the ability to choose up to two different heating systems. Some idea with the cooling system. Uh, a commonly mismarked one here is the unit AC. Uh, so a lot of people will see like those window units and they'll mark it as unit AC. That's not what this is. Uh, 
a, a unit AC it would be like a lot of times like high rise apartment complexes. Uh, they may have within each one of the units, they may have like a little like box on the wall or like a cabinet on the wall that uh, it just cools that one room. Uh, it, a lot of times it's not vented to the outside. It's just just for that one unit. It's meant for those larger occupancies like that with more multiple tenants where the, each room needs to be kind of kept in its own separate temperature. Um, so that's what the, the unit AC is. If you have a window unit, you would actually mark none because a window unit is considered personal property. Uh, if you were to remove that window unit from the window, you would just have to close the window. There's no change to the structure. The, bu the building hasn't changed at all. So it's not considered a part of the building. If it goes through the wall, like if you go to like one of those hotel motels uh, where they have the, the unit right below the window, but it's going through the wall. If I remove that unit, now there's a hole in the wall. So that has changed the structure. So those would be considered the true wall units, but your standard window unit would just be considered none. But the vast majority we'll see would be just that forced cool air. For a number of plumbing fixtures, this one says to leave it blank. So don't waste your time counting all the, the fixtures in the structure because once it, if you put it in here, the reviewer is just going to delete it and you've wasted your time. Mechanicals fire protection. So this section uh, is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the sprinkler system, that's pretty obvious. If they have a sprinkler system, you just need to tell what percentage of the building is covered by a sprinkler system. Most of the time, if they put in a sprinkler system, and if they go to that expense, they're going to cover the entire structure with it. So you would just put 100 there. But it is possible that, uh, especially if they do like a retrofitting, you know, in order to get occupancy, they have to add uh, sprinklers to an existing building. Well, then they may only need, they may only put the sprinkler into the portion of the building that needs it for the occupancy approval. Uh, so it's possible that they have less than 100%. And so you would just then calculate what percentage of the structure is covered by that sprinkler. Now the fire alarm system and the automatic fire detection system. So these two uh, are, are related, but there's a slight difference between them. So the fire alarm system is going to be just a, a local alarm system. So it's a sounds out here locally to alert you that there's a fire. Whereas the automatic fire detection system is going to be a little bit more elaborate. It's going to uh, ring out externally to like a, a central station alarm company like an ADT or it may, may ring out at the fire department, but it's going to alert somebody outside of the structure that the alarm has been sounded. And it's also going to potentially have some other automation. So it may like close fire doors within the building. It may uh, shut down the, the vents or the ductwork uh, of the HVAC system so that you don't have fire spreading through the, the building, through the ductwork. So it may have some of those automated processes in it. So if you have an automatic fire detection system, you will most likely also have the fire alarm system. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a fire alarm system that you automatically have the automatic fire detection. So the automatic fire detection is a little more advanced. Uh, it's more involved than the, just the local fire alarm system. If you do not have an alarm system, if you don't have a sprinkler, just leave these blank. Don't try to put zeros there. Again, the BBSC doesn't know what to do with zeros. Electrical quality, we have high, average, low, or none. So vast majority of the buildings you look at, you're just going to put as average. Uh, so that's assuming that they have circuit breakers with modern wiring, um, just your standard loading. High would be if they have like maybe like a machine shop or something like that where they have high voltage or just extremely high demand of electrical in there uh, that where you go to the panel wall and like the entire wall is these giant electrical panels. And that's what we're talking about with high. Low uh, could actually just be like if they're kind of older, outdated, like the fuse uh, panels where they're smaller, but like 60 amp fuses and things like that, where it's a smaller, uh, less lower powered system. And then none would be if they have no electrical. And then finally we get to the elevators. So we have to tell them how many passenger elevators there are and how many freight elevators there are. If they're none, then you just leave it as none. So that's the end of section one. So we would fill that entire section out for uh, 
if, if, if it, the whole building is one story or you know if it's all one number of stories we would just fill out that section and then we'd be done we just hit the update button and we're done but if we do have multiple sections so it was a different year of construction or different elevation then we would then start here with section two and we put our section name in here to identify what section we're working on and then we would fill out all that same information again for that section two and we get down to the end of section two and there's a section here for section three so if we had a third section we could then fill all that information in when we get to the end of section three though now we see a change here so we see equipment we have the ability to do, to do an itemized list of up to different, 10 different pieces of equipment here. This is something that we do not typically do. Uh, we do have to have it on the form because it is something that we could potentially do. Uh, we actually have one client right now that does ask for the itemized uh, equipment on the BDSC. But for that, that particular account, this is actually down in uh, Tennessee and Georgia. It's a, a church account that we have. For that, uh, I actually just have the inspectors gather a, a few extra pieces of information, a few extra photos, and then I actually go in there and I insert all of the itemized equipment for them. So we still, even though that account requires it, I don't have the inspector doing that. I'm doing that here internally for them. So just assume that you are not filling out the equipment section at all. If it was something where we needed you to do the equipment section, we would talk to you separately about that. We would give you guidance on how to do that and what we need you to do, what kind of information we need you to gather. But just assume otherwise that you are not filling out the equipment section. So once I filled all that information out, I would just hit the update button to save all that information and then I can move on to the next uh, form. Real quick, I'm gonna go ahead and fill out an example based on that Google map that we had here. So again, we're looking at this structure, we can see, all right, so we have a, a sprinkler connection here with the alarm. So we know that we have an alarm system. Uh, it looks like we have brick, probably on concrete block. Uh, we have a flat roof, probably a single ply membrane. So this section over here is all one story, a little bit warehouse. And I'm going to estimate that about 20 feet tall. Uh, over here, we have the two-story office building, which looks like about 10 feet per, per floor. Still looks like it's going to be the brick on block with uh, a flat roof. Uh, so we're going to have to make a couple of, of, of guesstimates on the finishes because we, we're not getting even inside the structure. So we can make a, a pretty good idea of what this building is. So I'm going to go ahead and do a quick measurement of this building so that I can get the square footages. So I'm just going to right click and then start tracing around it to get my measurements. All right, so I have the whole thing surrounded. So I just need to zoom out a little bit so that I can see the whole building. I'm going to collapse my side panel here so that I get rid of all of that extra information that I don't need. And then I would go ahead and print this to a PDF. So I right click and hit print and print this to a PDF to form my diagram. Uh, that's what I'm going to then submit to the client uh, for uh, the, the diagram of this building. So that gives me the ground floor square footage. So I'm going to write myself a quick little note here so I remember what my ground floor square footage is. Um, so I have 16,944, that's the ground floor. So I don't need to do this for the client. This is just my notes for myself. So I can remember what the square footages are once I go to actually complete the valuation. So that's the ground floor. Well, I know that this section over here was two story though. So I have to do a couple of extra calculations for myself before I can actually uh, complete the BDSC on this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna measure just that two story section. And I know that the ground floor of that two story section is 3512. So that means that the one-story section over here is going to be the difference of that. So I have the 16, 
944 minus 3512. So that means that the one story section is 13 432. So now what's the two story section? Well, that's easy. I just take the 3512 and multiply it by two because there's two stories. So that section here is going to be 70, 24. I do not need to submit this information to the client. I, I already gave them the diagram that gave them the gross, uh, the ground floor square footage. This is strictly for me, for my uh, knowledge when I go to fill out the form. So now I can go ahead and I can come back to my building, my BVSC here. I only have the one building, so I don't need to put anything here unless this is auto owners, then I would put the auto owners ID here. But I assuming this is not auto owners and this is my only building, so I can leave the section blank. I'll leave the second, second section blank. I do have two sections here, so I'm going to identify that the first section I'm dealing with is the one story. I'm going to leave this section blank for the system default. We're going to say that our building was built in 1980. And I'm going to say that it's average. So if it was built in 1980, that makes it 42 years old. So the effective age would be 21. The number of stories for this is the, the one story. The gross floor square footage of the one story section is 13,432. Gross perimeter, I'm leaving blank. Construction quality average, year built 1980. And this portion of the structure was a warehouse. So I'm kind of come down here and here's my warehouse light. And it was a 100% warehouse and it was 20 feet tall. So I have 100% of my occupancy, so I can skip on down here. And we said that it was concrete or brick on concrete block. And I'm guessing that it's got steel bar joists for the roof. So we're going to call this one 100% class four. It looked like it was a slab, so I'm leaving the, the foundation blank. Exterior wall finish was the brick on masonry. Roof material was single ply membrane. Oops. And it was flat. Floor finish, I'm guessing that the warehouse just had concrete uh, finish there. Leaving the interior wall partitions blank, interior wall finish. I'm guessing that it was paint directly onto the concrete block. Ceiling finish, there probably wasn't any kind of ceiling finish in that area up there because it's just a warehouse. Mechanical heating, I'm guessing it was the suspended unit heaters, and there's probably no cooling in that warehouse. Plumbing default, I'm, or plumbing system, I'm leaving as default. Sprinkler system, we did see a sprinkler system, and so, and we saw an alarm system. We know it's at least the local alarm because we saw the, the bell on the outside there. I'm going to guess that it also has the uh, automated, the central station along there. And then the quality for the electrical is average. There's no elevators, it's one story. So then I get to section two, where I'm going to talk about the two story portion of the building. It also is average condition and 21 years for the effective age. Two stories here and 70, 24 for the, the two story section. Average quality, 1980, but this is going to be offices and 10 feet per floor. I'm going to keep it as class four, though. It still says slab foundation, brick on masonry for my exterior walls. Still say single ply membrane for the roof. Still flat. Floor finish, though, here I'm going to have some carpeting. I'm going to have some tile ceramic and maybe even some tile vinyl composite. So we're going to say that it's like 80, well, we made it so 85% carpeting, 10% or 5% tile ceramic, and 10% vinyl composite. So we add up to 100% there. Wall partition, we're leaving that blank. Wall finish, we're going to have painted drywall. So we go 100% drywall. 100% paint. The ceiling is probably going to be a suspended acoustical in there. Heating system is going to be forced warm air. 
cooling system for school air and the uh, sprinkler system and alarm systems in the average electrical quality. And so then I just hit my save or update to save that and that building is complete. So that gives you an example of how you would fill out a building that has multiple elevations, and therefore multiple sections on the BVSC. Are there any questions that I can address for you before we end this session? All right, well, I do appreciate you spending the time with me this morning. Hopefully it was helpful to you. Uh, I am going to send those two documents off, off to you in email so that you have those just to make sure that you uh, have those available to you. Um, if you have questions, please let us know. Send me an email, give me a call, send me a text. Uh, you can contact anyone here in our office. We can all help you out with the BDSC or any other questions that you have, but we do want you to ask those questions so that we can help you out. It's much easier for us to help you out while you're doing it than it is for it to come in incorrectly and have us have to send it back to you with corrections. So make sure you're asking those questions ahead of time. But otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting and let you go on your way.